Welcome everyone. Oh, there we go. Welcome everyone. Um, we're here for our MCHRI seminar series. Um, before we introduce our um, speakers, I have a couple slides to go through. Can you advance for me, Grant? There we go. Um, just a quick plug. This is our MCHRI education committee, which I'm a part of, as well as Trung Fam. We are the two moderating your, um, the session today. Um, we put on these seminars as well as our um, annual symposium. If you want to go forward, Grant. So go ahead and save the date for our fifth annual Maternal and Child Health Research Institute Symposium. It's scheduled for Thursday, October 20th. Uh, we already have a great um, keynote speaker series uh, prepared or, or um, scheduled already and focused on community engaged research with a pretty high profile um, lineup, which we're very excited about. So. Um, save the date, registration's coming soon, and get your abstracts ready to submit. And then we also um, are very excited to be hosting another Eureka Certificate course in Translational Medicine. Um, this will, I believe, be the second one that we will have at Stanford. I participated in the first one, which was really right before the pandemic started. Um, it's a wonderful course um, where you get a lot of networking, a lot of instruction, um, and kind of hands-on training um, in all aspects of translational medicine. It uh, takes place at the Asilomar Conference Grounds in Monterey. It's a, a four or five day um, uh, uh, seminar, and it's, um, it's wonderful. Um, if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to myself as I was uh, an alumni through the, through the program or to Grant um, specifically, but um, I think applications will be opening soon. And with that, I think I'm going to turn it over to Trung to introduce our speakers. Great. Thank you, Liz. Uh, it is my absolute pleasure to introduce, to welcome our uh, speakers for today's seminar, um, Dr. Anna Bloin and her postdoctoral fellow, Dr. Nicole Krantz. I will say a few words about Anna, and um, Anna will introduce Nicole in a bit. So Dr. Anna Bloin is a professor of pediatrics in the Division of Endocrinology and of Genetics at Stanford. She is a world leading scientist in use in human genetics and naturally occurring mutations to identify regulatory pathways and gain insight into normal tissue physiology, particularly uh, pancreatic beta cell development and function, as well as to understand the development, uh, the pathogenesis of uh, diabetes. She uh, has received numerous awards for her groundbreaking research. Uh, particularly uh, the prestigious Minkowski Award from the European um, Association for the Study of Diabetes and the uh, Outstanding Scientific Achievement Award from the American uh, associate um, the American Diabetes Association. Um, Anna is not only a phenomenal scientist, but she's also an outstanding leader, mentor, and educator. She is currently the associate chair uh, of uh, basic research for our department of pediatrics. She also co-directs the um, basic and translational scholarly concentration for our Stanford Pediatrics Residency Program. Anna and Nicole, I'm so looking forward to, to learn more about your work today. Thank you, Trung and Liz. It's a, a great pleasure to uh, be with you this afternoon and to have the opportunity to uh, share with you a little bit of the uh, work that our lab are doing here at Stanford. And I'm particularly excited about the opportunity today to uh, be the warm up act for uh, a super uh, postdoctoral scientist, Nicole Krentz, who will be delivering the bulk of the science uh, and interesting uh, new data uh, this afternoon. So we're going to kick off um, with a little bit of an overview of what our lab uh, works on before we spend the majority of the seminar really uh, digging into uh, an exciting project that uh, Nicole is leading on in our lab. And this is a particularly relevant project for this audience because it's funded through the MCHRI uh, as Nicole is the recipient of a postdoctoral uh, fellowship from uh, the MCHRI for which we're very grateful. So um, 
you may or may not know, but our lab is uh, interested in the uh, underlying mechanisms that lead to pancreatic islet cell dysfunction and metabolic tissue dysregulation that uh, are a major cause of diabetes. And I think it's worth just reminding this audience of uh, how important understanding diabetes pathogenesis is. In the United States, if we look at uh, the data collected in 2017, it's estimated that over 300, uh, over 34 million Americans are living with uh, diabetes. But perhaps more sobering is the fact that most people don't even know they have diabetes, and there's a further 88 million people who have prediabetes. If you care about the numbers and how much this costs to treat and manage people who are suffering with uh, diabetes, in the US alone, it's over 327 billion. And this is because diabetes has a major impact on both the quality of life and the uh, uh, length of life. It's a major cause of vision loss, of amputations, of kidney and liver disease. Most alarmingly, though, is the fact that diabetes now uh, has an effect on our uh, adolescent children and uh, 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 young populations. And if we look at the data coming out of the search uh, study for diabetes in youth, we can see the sobering numbers that show the increase in newly diagnosed cases of both type one and type two diabetes in children and teens. And between 2002 and 2015, there was a 4.8% increase in the uh, incidence of type two diabetes and a 1.9% increase in the incidence of type one diabetes. Now, another important key finding has been that the rises in diabetes prevalence hit different uh, ethnic groups uh, in a different manner. And we're seeing very alarming increases in type 2 diabetes, in particular in the Asian Pacific Islanders, Hispanic, non-Hispanic, Black and American Indian uh, populations. So given the alarming numbers of uh, people globally, not just in the United States with diabetes and the cost of treating diabetes and its complications, it's really important that we find uh, improved ways to prevent diabetes and to uh, treat people uh, who suffer from diabetes and the life changing complications that can arise. So what do we want to know when we design a new drug to treat somebody with diabetes? Well, we want to know if we perturb a particular protein, will it work and will it be safe? So how can human genetics help us identify safe and effective drug, uh, drug targets for therapeutic development? Well, if we have a DNA variant in a gene that alters uh, the amount of protein that the body makes or the level of activity of that protein, we can use that information to understand whether or not it's a loss or a gain of that protein function that is protective for diabetes. And that's really useful because it can uh, inform a, a pharmaceutical company whether or not to make an agonist or an antagonist. If the uh, uh, variation is associated with diabetes risk, what's really useful is that we have evidence in humans that perturbing that particular protein or pathway is likely to influence diabetes risk. And this can give uh, enormous com uh, confidence to uh, pharmaceutical companies that this is likely to get past uh, the preclinical animal models where a lot of therapeutics fail on account of efficacy as well as safety. Furthermore, what we can also uh, understand from studying the impact of DNA variation on protein activity in a population over a length of time is we can understand what the long-term effect is of perturbing a particular protein or pathway. And this is really powerful information because it can tell us about the long-term consequences of uh, uh, stimulating that pathway. And that can give us a really good handle on the likelihood of adverse uh, side effects from developing developing therapeutics that target, that target that protein or pathway. So for many years now, our lab has been uh, interested in taking human genetic discoveries, whether these are really rare mutations in the population that are causal for monogenic varieties of diabetes, 
or if these are common variants present in uh, most of us in the population that increase your risk of developing uh, type 2 diabetes. And using those uh, DNA changes as tools to interrogate the cellular and molecular mechanisms that underlie pancreatic beta cell dysfunction in particular, but also, as you'll hear later from Nicole, other uh, metabolic tissues to understand what's driving diabetes pathogenesis. And our lab isn't just uh, interested in uh, cataloging these mechanisms. We have a real genuine interest in being able to take that information and to translate it into a clinical tool, whether this is the identification of biomarkers that help us prioritize patients for genetic testing, whether this is the identification of safe and effective targets for uh, therapeutic development, or increasingly whether this provides us with a tool to stratify patients so that we can provide uh, the most, um, uh, a most useful uh, uh, therapeutic uh, regime to that uh, particular group of individuals. So evidence that this is likely to be a successful endeavor comes from uh, many sources, but one that's very close to my heart is work that I was involved in as a postdoctoral fellow working with Andrew Hattersley at the University of Exeter in the UK. And when I was a postdoc working with Andrew, uh, I uh, identified the heterozygous activating mutations in a key component of the machinery that couples glucose metabolism to insulin secretion in the pancreatic beta cell were a major cause of neonatal diabetes. Now, this was exciting for a couple of reasons. First of all, we were uh, identifying a common genetic etiology for a, a, a rare form of diabetes, which in itself was exciting. But uh, perhaps more importantly, on, uh, on the back of being able to uh, understand how these mutations caused uh, a lack of insulin secretion from the pancreatic beta cell, and understanding that the mechanism was a failure of this potassium channel to close in response to ATP generated from glucose metabolism, we were able to hypothesize that children like Lily with this rare form of diabetes could be treated with an oral hypoglycemic agent called a sulfonylurea, because we knew that this class of drugs were work by closing this uh, uh, KTP channel by an ATP independent mechanism. So this was an example of precision medicine, being able to tailor treatment uh, based on the underlying genetic etiology. But perhaps more importantly, it was also evidence that human genetics could identify safe and effective targets for novel therapeutic development to treat patients with type 2 diabetes, because after all, the sulfonylureas were already widely used to treat uh, patients with type 2 diabetes. So in recent years, uh, genome-wide association studies have been phenomenally successful in delivering regions of our genome that robustly associate with altering your risk of developing complex diseases. And one of the uh, shining examples has been the way that we've been able to use GWAS to understand the underlying genetic landscape of type 2 diabetes. And in our most recent publication just this year, we now have well over 350 regions of the genome where we know that there are clues as to what goes wrong in type 2 diabetes. But unlike those variants that I identified in the gene encoding the potassium channel in Lily, most of the variants that we've identified from genome-wide association studies are in the non-coding regions of the genome. And this makes it very challenging to go from the genetic signal to understanding the underlying uh, biology that's influencing disease risk. If we look at our most recent uh, report, we probably now understand about 50% of the genetic risk for diabetes. So from the genetic studies that we've done in uh, over a million individuals across multiple ancestries, we've probably got about half of the genetic information. And if we were to assemble all the genes that we think are underlying those 350 signals, we've got strong evidence for candidacy of around 117 genes. So we're making pretty good progress, but we're certainly not getting everything we can out of these clues that have been uncovered from the GWAS studies. So why is this? What are the challenges with moving from those hundreds of clues into disease biology to actually having new pathogenic mechanisms for diabetes risk? 
Well, a major challenge is that we need to correctly identify the effect of transcript, the gene in which those GWAS signals are altering uh, gene regulation and function. And the reason this is so difficult is because we have these GWAS signals that are in intergenic non-coding regions of the genome. And we don't know whether they're altering regulation of gene A, gene B, or gene C, or even if they're altering regulation of more than one of these genes. And it gets even more complicated because gene regulation is highly context specific. And this means gene regulation is different in the different cells in our body. It differs at different developmental time points. And it also matters whether or not we're perturbing or stimulating a cell because those things also alter gene regulation. So you can imagine that given this complexity, it's not really surprising that we've got a major bottleneck in our ability to go from those 350 clues into diabetes pathogenesis to identifying the underlying proteins that are mediating disease risk. So I told you about some of the challenges with context specificity. And for diabetes, uh, we have many tissues that we're interested in because we know that they're important in glucose uh, homeostasis. We, of course, have the pancreatic islet, but we also have adipocytes, we have myocytes, the liver, the brain, the gut, and the kidney, to name but a few. And all of these tissues are really important in uh, governing uh, glucose uh, metabolism. So how can we uh, use existing data to help us identify which uh, tissues we should prioritize for our investigation? Well, in our lab, we've got two major ways that we uh, go about this. First of all, we always try and consider how variants that influence diabetes risk might also alter uh, traits that are relevant to uh, diabetes pathophysiology. For example, we look at whether or not variants in the non-diabetic population alter fasting glucose levels, fasting insulin levels, whether they alter your BMI, your waist hip ratio or your lipids. Because if we find a, an association with one of those traits, it might help us decide whether or not the GWAS variant is altering uh, diabetes risk through defects in how your pancreatic islets work, how your fat cells work or how your liver works, for example. Another tool we use increasingly is to try and use epigenomic annotation. So to look at the regulatory landscape of each of these disease relevant tissues and see whether or not the GWAS variants that are driving the association signal are sitting in regulatory annotation that's really important for gene regulation in one of these tissues. And in doing this, we've been able to establish from both human physiology and from epigenetics that the pancreatic islet is a really important tissue for mediating the effect of a large number of these signals on diabetes risk. Now, that can take us a very long time to link whether or not a variant is altering a particular regulatory element in a tissue and if that's altering gene expression. So in the meantime, we've tried to take a shortcut wherever possible by asking the question, are there protein coding variants that are independently associated with type 2 diabetes risk that provide a molecular signpost that take us straight to a protein that we might be interested in following up in the laboratory? And that's really where I'm going to hand over to uh, Nicole Krentz this afternoon, who is going to tell you some of the work that we've been doing now for many years on a locus called the REB1 SSR1 locus. And this is a really uh, exciting example of how we can bring together many different uh, uh, approaches in our laboratory and to drill down on interesting biology just from studying one of those 350 signals. So I'm really delighted now to hand over to uh, Nicole. Uh, Nicole is uh, a senior postdoc in the team. And uh, Nicole and I made this journey to Stanford together because I was very fortunate that uh, after her PhD at the University of British Columbia, where she studied uh, regulatory mechanisms uh, for pancreatic islet cell de development in both mice and humans, she uh, moved to Oxford to start her postdoctoral training with me. And uh, when I was uh, negotiating uh, my move to Stanford, uh, I was so excited to uh, uh, find that Nicole was uh, 
keen to make the journey with me and she's really been absolutely critical to uh, the setup of our lab here at Stanford. So Nicole, uh, over to you. I'm excited for you to share the work that you've been doing that's funded by your uh, independent postdoctoral fellowship from the uh, MCHRI. Awesome. Thanks, Anna. I think you might need to stop sharing screen. There we go. Perfect. Okay. So as Anna mentioned, I'm going to take you through some of our work on the Reb1 locus. Um, and this is work that was started before I joined the team. And so we're part of what we call Team Reb1. That includes myself, as well as Grace Yu, a postdoc who now has an independent position in China, and also Katya Mattis, who was a PhD student with Anna. And I'll try to point out along the way work that was done by others. So the REP1 SSR1 locus, as I mentioned, is one that our lab has been really focusing on for about seven or eight years now. And so it's the genetics at this locus that makes it very interesting. And that's because there's three independent signals. So here I'm showing you a locus zoom plot for the genetic association. Um, and the p-value here is on the left. So anything that crosses this dotted line is significant. And on the bottom, I'm showing you the uh, genes that are in this region. So we have REB1 as well as surrounding genes such as SSR1. And so from exome array studies, we identified two uh, independent coding variants that are associated for both type 2 diabetes and fasting glucose. And remember, whenever there's a coding variant, that gets us very excited because that means that it's um, likely acting through that particular protein. There's also a third independent signal that's in the phi prime uh, region of the REB1 locus, and it has also been independently reported for type 2 diabetes. <laughs> So why as geneticists do we get excited by this locus? Um, there's a lot going on and it gives us a lot of um, insight into what REB1 might be doing in the pathophysiology of diabetes. So the fact that there is coding variant, as Anna and I have now mentioned, that gives us a lot of insight into the effector transcript, right? Because that mutation is affecting a particular protein. So we know that it's that protein that is likely driving the association. What's interesting though, is that there's multiple signals here, and we believe now that two of those signals are acting through regulatory uh, variants. And that's exciting because this tells us that there's tissue specific effects. And so this is going to not impact, unlike a coding variant that impacts all cells in which that protein is expressed, a regulatory variant is gonna have a very specific window of time or maybe a specific cell type through which it's acting. Also, these three signals have different metabolic signatures. So by that, we mean the effect of the different traits and magnitude is slightly different. So signal one is mostly a uh, type two diabetes risk association. It has a bit of effect on the fasting glucose, but mainly it's driving a type two diabetes association. Whereas signal two is the converse. So it has a little bit of an effect on type two diabetes risk, but it really has a strong association with fasting glucose levels. And finally, this third signal does not have an association with fasting glucose, but it does with type 2 diabetes risk. So why is that different metabolic signatures exciting? That tells us that there's probably different contributions of the metabolic tissues. So remember that type 2 diabetes is a, a disease that involves multiple different cell types, including the pancreatic islets, adipose tissue, liver, and muscle. And so the fact that we're seeing different a coding variant and two regulatory variants that are having different magnitudes of effect tells us that there's likely different contributions of these tissues. And therefore, REB1 has an important role in all of these different cell types. So what were the questions we set out to answer? The first one is, what's the effector transcript at this locus? Because there's a coding variant, we were already stacking the odds in our favor that it's likely being driven through REB1. What tissues are involved in influencing diabetes risk? Is it only the islet or are there other cell types that are involved? Why do the different signals have different metabolic signatures? Is that due to a, a pleiotropic effect or an influence of the different tissues? How do these variants alter diabetes risk? 
And do these risk alleles cause a loss or gain of function? And as Anna was mentioning, as we look to translate these findings from the basic science towards the clinic, we really need to understand whether it's a loss or gain of function, because that tells us whether we need to generate agonists or antagonists uh, for the therapeutic side. And again, when we're thinking about therapeutic translation, we need to know what are the other consequences of targeting REB1. Is it going to have an effect outside of the tissues that we're interested in? So our approach in the lab is to always start with the human genetics, and this is because it provides a strong rationale for the locus or the gene being important in disease. We then use both model organisms and cellular models to study what REB1 does both on the whole body physiology, but also in a particular cell type. Once we've identified what REB1 is doing in individual cells or in the whole body, we can then go back and confirm whether our observations are also seen in human primary tissue. So from the human genetics and genomics, the first question we need to answer is which gene or genes are involved? So as I said, our lab has had a long-standing interest in this locus, and over time with larger and more diverse sample sizes, we've been able to really refine the genetics. And this is work that was led by Anuba Mahajan and Jason Torres at Oxford. So they used fine mapping. So this is a statistical method that allows us to assign probabilities that a particular variant is causal for the association signals. So from those efforts, we've now narrowed down that that first signal is driven by a coding variant. And this is a D to N amino acid change at position 1171. And so again, one, once we know that it's a coding variant that's causal, that gets us very excited because that's telling us that REV1 is playing a very important role in mediating disease risk. For the second signal, we originally had this labeled as a coding variant, but now with uh, increasing genetic sample size, we've now narrowed it down to uh, one of 21 variants, and 20 of those are regulatory. So we don't believe that this signal is being driven by a coding variant, but rather a regulatory variant. And that's very interesting because, again, that tells us that this is going to be playing a very specific role during a developmental window or in a particular cell type. The third signal is a little bit more complicated. Um, it's a five, we've got it narrowed down to a five megabase region, but unfortunately the credible set has over 200 variants. Um, and so this is a signal that we're very keen to follow up on, but at this point it's a bit difficult to do in the lab because it could be any one of 200 different SNPs that are driving the association. So from the first signal, we know that it's REB1. It's a coding variant, it's gonna affect the REB1 protein but signals two and three are both thought to now be regulatory variants, which means it could either be working through REB1, or perhaps it's working through either the neighboring gene, SSR1, or maybe it's acting over a long range for other genes. And so remember that the regulatory variants, there's an added layer of complexity <clears throat> because those variants are gonna have cell type specific effects or possibly developmental roles. <laughs> And so as Anna was saying, we need to really understand where, when, and maybe under what conditions um, these variants might be acting. The interesting thing um, about this locus is the fact that we have both coding and regulatory variants, and they're associated with different um, traits or diseases. This tells us that the coding and regulatory variants are working maybe through the same gene, but they're having different effects. And that's because of a different temporal window or cell type specific effect. So what can we do to try to understand where or what genes signal two and signal three are working through? So we can try and use some different methods um, such as EQT, EQTL co-localization. So this is where we ask, does the same variant that drives uh, association with a given trait, does it also uh, associate with changes in gene expression. So in other words, does the risk allele um, for type 2 diabetes, does it also associate with either an increased or decreased expression of REB1? If it does, then that tells us that that regulatory variant might be acting by increasing or decreasing expression of REB1. Unfortunately, with our current data sets, we don't see any evidence of co-localization. 
So we don't have any evidence there supporting that signal two or three are acting through REV1. Another method that we can use is regulatory annotation. So this is asking whether a particular variant sits within a tissue specific enhancer. Bonus points if it also alters a transcription factor binding site that's super important in that cell type of issue, that would really be strong evidence that um, that particular variant is altering REV1 expression. Also, does it sit in open chromatin? So in a particular cell type, is that region of the genome open and accessible? Unfortunately, again, we don't see any um, evidence in the regulatory annotation of the signal two or three driving expression of REV1. Why is this? Um, it could be a lack of power. So we, maybe we don't have a strong enough sample size. Maybe we're looking at the wrong tissue or cell type. Or more likely, are we looking at the wrong time point? A lot of our data is in adult tissue, but as I've mentioned several times now, regulatory effects likely affect the developmental time point. So maybe we need to include regulatory annotation during development. In the meantime, as we try to add more and more um, or more and more data sets to these types of analyses, what other routes can we use to help us understand what's happening at this locus? So REV1 is a zinc finger transcription factor. Um, transcription factors are my favorite types of protein, and that's because they either activate or repress the expression of other genes. So they're kind of leaders in the cell. REP1 is a transcription factor that's pretty widely expressed. So here I have expression from GTEx across adipose, liver, muscle, and pancreas. And you can see that we can detect REP1 transcripts across all of these different cell types. REP1 has been studied quite a bit in um, cancer, and it's been shown to target promoters downstream of both the RAS MAP kinase pathways. It's implicated in proliferation, transcriptional regulation as a transcription factor, and also DNA repair. It has been proposed to potentially be a proto-oncogene, and that's because it's overexpressed in several types of cancer, including pancreatic cancer. And then more recently, there's been a study showing that haploinsufficiency in REB1 is implicated in a Noonan-like rasopathy, um, and it's part of a common deletion um, so they do believe that it's REB1 that's in, uh, involved in this uh, pathology. Um, but unfortunately, they didn't look at any metabolic phenotyping of these patients. So we really don't understand what REB1 does in metabolic cells. So the first thing we wanted to know is what does global knockout of REB1 look like in model organisms? And so this is going to really mirror that signal one, that coding mutation. It's going to show us what loss of function of the REB1 protein does in the whole body physiology. And so to study this, we looked at zebrafish. This was done in collaboration with Christoph Metzendorf and Marcel Dunhood in Uppsala. So they have a zebrafish model where they can use CRISPR-Cas9 to knock out the orthologs of REB1 in the fish. And then they look at several different um, physiological measurements. If, and of particular interest for us, a lot of these seem to be impacting the pancreatic beta cell. So this is a forest plot. What you're looking for are confidence intervals that do not cross the center line, and that tells you whether it's significant. So if you lose REP1 in the zebrafish, there's a decrease in glucose levels. There's an increase in the total number of beta cells, but each of these individual beta cells have reduced insulin transcript expression. And overall, the uh, fish are also smaller in length. So this got us really excited that there could be something, um, some sort of role for REB1 in the pancreatic beta cell. And so we then turn to our cellular models where we can look specifically at the pancreatic beta cell and ask what happens if we perturb REB1. So this was work started by Katia Mattis during her PhD, and we've recently pre-printed this manuscript on BioArchive. And what Katia did is she focused on using two different human cellular models. The first model I'm gonna talk about today is the endo-C beta H1. This is a human beta cell line. And we used siRNAs to knock down uh, the transcript of REB1. So you can see with uh, siRNAs, we're able to significantly reduce REB1 expression by about 40%. What we were excited to see is that knockdown of REB1 in the endo C cells reduced expression of insulin 
the insulin gene. So the major role of the pancreatic beta cell is to generate insulin protein and secrete it in response to glucose. So this was really exciting to see a loss of insulin transcript. Not only do we see this at the transcript level, but we also see a reduction in insulin protein content. So the next question was, okay, we have less insulin around, but do they still secrete insulin in response to glucose? And it turns out with a transient loss of REB1, the beta cells are still able to secrete insulin in response to high glucose, regardless of whether there's REB1 present or not. And so we wondered if, if this is because we're just using a transient knockdown, what happens if we generate a full knockout? So to do this, we used uh, CRISPR-Cas9 genome editing. So we generated four different guide RNAs that are targeting throughout the coding region of the REB1 gene. So the coding region is shown here in red. And when we did this in our normal endo-C cells, you can see REB1 is highly expressed. We also generated what we call a crispr um, sham or a control cell line that are still wild type for REB1 but they overexpress the Cas9 protein. And we also generated the knockout cells. So those are expressing the Cas9 protein in the presence of the guide RNAs, which means that we have a complete loss of Reb1 protein. So like we saw with the transient loss of function, if we have full Reb1 knockout endo-C beta H1 cells, we also see a significant reduction in insulin expression at the transcript level. And this was uh, to a greater degree than we saw with the transient. And we also see about a 50% reduction in insulin content. But does that mean we have an effect on insulin secretion? Unfortunately, no. So even with a 50% reduction in insulin content, the beta cells were able to still secrete insulin appropriately in response to low or high glucose stimulation. So we started to wonder, how is that? There's 50% you know, of a reduction in insulin. How are they still able to secrete uh, insulin in response to glucose? So a great deal of uh, a beta cell's energy is devoted to both making and processing insulin protein and secreting it in response to glucose. So the beta cell has the glucose transporters on the cell membrane that are able to sense glucose and take it up into the cell. The glucose is then metabolized, and this leads to membrane depolarization and insulin secretion. And so we thought that maybe what's happening is that even though there's a 50% reduction in insulin content, maybe there's still enough insulin around that's able to secrete in response to glucose. But what happens if we try to hit a different part of the pathway that really causes a massive wave of insulin secretion? And so to do that, we used forscolin, which acts through cyclic AMP and causes a massive uh, secretion of insulin. So indeed, that was uh, sufficient to cause a defect in insulin secretion. So when we really push these beta cells that have less insulin content to try to secrete insulin in response to forscolin, we see a reduction in the amount of insulin that can be secreted. So that tells us that we have uh, a sufficient phenotype where there's less uh, insulin around that under periods of prolonged demand, they're unable to respond to or to glucose appropriately. What we wanted to do is kind of mimic what would happen in a, a case of someone who is progressing through type 2 diabetes where there's this prolonged demand for a lot of insulin secretion. And so what we did is we really exhaust that readily releasable pool of insulin using forscolin. We let the cells recover and then we tried to stimulate with high glucose. And so if we exhaust that readily releasable pool of insulin, there's not enough insulin being made in order to uh, overcome that. And then there's still now a defect in both basal and high glucose insulin secretion with loss of REB1. So this was telling us that REB1 plays a very important role in the beta cell. And if you knock it out, you have less insulin content. And that means that the beta cells are unable to secrete insulin along under periods of prolonged stress. Why is that mechanistically? So REB1 is a transcription factor. So of course we went and looked at the transcriptome of these cells. We did this both in the siRNA and the knockout cells. 
So if our transient loss of function, we found over 2000 genes that were differentially expressed, and many of these were predicted, predicted to be REB1 target genes. Um, the majority of these were upregulated, and they were also found to be involved in insulin secretion, so regulation of exocytosis, transmission across chemical synapses. So this tells us that in response to the less insulin protein being made, the cells are upregulating genes that are involved in insulin secretion to try to compensate for that reduction in insulin content. We see the same thing in our knockout cells. So a few more differentially expressed genes, but about 2,600 genes that were differentially expressed. The majority of these were upregulated. And again, they were involved, uh, genes that were involved in insulin secretion. What really got us excited was that there was a subset of these genes that were involved in stem cell fate and early endoderm formation. And as a developmental biologist, I was really keen to see this because this tells us that REB1 might be not only playing a role in the beta cell itself, but also in how those beta cells form during development. So Katia used human-induced pluripotent stem cells, which is another model we like to use in our lab. And she used CRISPR-Cas9 to knock out REB1 again, using two different guide RNAs uh, to generate REB1 knockout cells. Important to know that our uh, regular stem cell line was actually heterozygous for that risk allele. So not only did she knock out the gene, she generated wild type where she corrected the heterozygous mutation to just be homozygous for the major allele. <laughs> What's great about the stem cell model is that we can differentiate them in vitro towards pancreatic beta cells. And so this mimics the normal stages of embryonic development. We used a protocol that was uh, published in 2014 by the Kiefer Lab at UBC, and it requires uh, the addition of different factors throughout uh, about a two to three week period in order to generate what we call beta-like cells. So REB1, the transcript is expressed throughout this differentiation period. So from the stem cell towards the beta-like cell, you can see in gray is the wild type. And in our knockout cell lines in purple have a loss of REB1 transcript. We've also shown that it's lost at the protein level. Because REB1 is a transcription factor, we did transcriptomic profiling using RNA-seq. And here are the different stages in color and the shapes indicate whether it's wild type or knockout. And what's exciting to see here is we do see uh, the cells are undergoing the normal stages of development, but what we're starting to see um, from the pancreatic progenitor, progenitor stage onward, the knockout cells seem to be performing faster or differentiating faster. So now, we now have three different transcriptomic data sets from the endocene knockdown, knockout, as well as the beta-like cells derived from the stem cells. So we wanted to know, is there a common signature for what happens when REB1 is lost in a pancreatic beta cell? And indeed, we did find a subset of genes that were commonly uh, found across these three different data sets. What was exciting is that our in silico analyses supported RFX6 or RFX family members as an upstream regulator of these differentially expressed genes. An RFX family is a very uh, interesting set of genes and they've already been implicated in various uh, diabetes pathophysiologies. So we're really excited to follow up on whether REB1 is playing a role in these processes through regulating expression of RFX. In particular, we saw that loss of REB1 increases expression of two different RFX target genes. That's CAM kinase 2A and also GPR56. So again, during development in our knockout cells, we saw an upregulation of these two target genes if you lost REB1. And so we wondered if this is mediated by RFX, RFX. So in other words, can we rescue this upregulation of these two genes by knocking down RFX family members? And indeed, we did find that this was the case. And in particular, it was RFX3 that seemed to be driving this upregulation of the two genes. So we took our wild type and knockout REB1 cells, and we used sRNAs to knock down RFX3. <laughs> And when we did this, we were able to partially rescue the upregulation of CAM kinase 2A that we see in our knockout REB1 cells. 
And similarly, uh, the upregulation of GPR56, we were able to partially rescue that with knockdown of RFX3. So this tells us that REB1 is playing a very important role in the developing beta cell and also in an adult beta cell. And this appears to be partially driven through effects of RFX uh, family members, including RFX3. So through our fish and our cellular models, we've identified a critical role for REB1 in the beta cell. And this nicely fits with associations that we see. But we also see associations with uh, height, waist hip ratio, and bone mineral density. So we next wanted to understand how REB1 might be playing a role in these tissues and these traits. So again, we returned to our model organism. And this time we looked at a mouse. And this is work done by Grace uh, in collaboration with Roger Cox at, Mar at uh, Harwell in the University of Oxford. And she generated a global heterozygous REB1 knockout mouse. So the homozygous is uh, embryonic lethal. So Grace was limited to looking only at the het mouse. And she found that these mice were smaller so here we have both males and females, and you can see that the heterozygous mice are smaller. That fits with the genetic association with height. We also show that these uh, mice have reduced body weight, in particular on high fat diet, and they have a reduction in fat mass on a high fat diet. And so this started to get us interested in the adipocyte. Um, she also performed a few studies looking at uh, glucose metabolism, and she didn't see any effect on the ability of the cells to secrete uh, insulin in response to glucose. But what she did see is that the cell, uh, the mice had uh, peripheral tissues that were more sensitive to insulin. So they were able to take up glucose in those peripheral tissues in response to insulin faster. Um, not only that, but the knockout mice were actually had smaller adipocytes. So here we're looking at the male mice across four different uh, fat pads, and you can see a shift in the frequency and the size of smaller adipocytes. And this is interesting because there's a lot of evidence in the literature that smaller adipocytes are more insulin sensitive. So maybe that's why these mice are more insulin sensitive. Grace then did an in vitro study where she took uh, the stromal vascular fraction, so pre-adipocytes from the mouse. She cultured them in the lab and differentiated them towards fat cells. And she asked whether there was fewer fat cells in the REB1 knockout compared to wild type. And that is what she saw using oil red O staining as a surrogate to identify adipocytes. So heterozygous knockout mice have fewer uh, adipocytes in vitro. So this suggests that REB1 might be playing a role in the differentiation of fat. So not only was there an association with height and fat or waist hip ratio in the human genetics, but there was also an association with bone mineral density. And Grace was able to show that this was also recapitulated in the mouse model. So using DEXA scans, she found that both males and females, the heterozygous knockout mice, had an increase in bone mineral density. And so I was really interested in this uh, cellular phenotype of the fat versus bone, and I wanted to turn to some of our in vitro cellular models to try to understand what REB1 is doing in regulating both fat and bone. And this was work that was funded through the MCHRI and my postdoctoral fellowship. So what I did find is that REB1 is important for making fat cells in the human. So I used a human model. This is a pre-adipocyte model that you can differentiate towards adipocytes in culture. And I used transient knockdown using siRNAs, and I was able to reduce expression of REB1. And this was sufficient to decrease expression of three key adipocyte genes, CEBPA, PPAR gamma, and ADIPOQ. So again, that's telling us that REB1 has a very important developmental role in making fat. And I was really interested in this cell fate between fat and bone. And that's because both fat and bone can form from a common progenitor cell. And so I wondered if the, without REB1, if the reason they're making less fat is because they're actually shifting and making bone cells instead. 
So this is a collaboration with Joy Wu at Stanford. And I took, again, those same, same stem cells that we're able to use and make beta cells from. But instead, this time I tried making both fat and bone. So this is driving them through their normal developmental process to this common precursor cell and then to a diplocytes. And what I found is with REB1 knockout, I again saw a reduction in the ability of cells to upregulate three key genes that are involved in a diplocyte formation. Not only that, but when I take those common precursors and I try to make osteoblast or bone cells, again, I see a shift and found that there was more expression of this uh, osteoblast marker, osteopontin. So it seems like without REB1, the cells are unable to form adipocytes as readily and instead are shuttling or skewing towards the bone lineage. So we've shown that loss of REB1 results in association with multiple different genetic, uh, multiple different traits. We've shown through our various models that type 2 diabetes protective alleles, such as the coding allele, is likely loss of function because throughout our different models, we're seeing that there's no evidence of diabetes with REB1 loss of function. So the last thing we want to do is go back into that human tissue and see if the associations and the phenotypes we're seeing in our model organisms and in our cells are also holding up in human primary tissue. And so we did this in two particular cell types, that's the uh, islet and also the fat. So I'll start here by talking about the islets. And this was a collaboration headed by Han Sun in our lab in collaboration with Pat McDonald at the University of Alberta. And remember that there are multiple different signals and they're associated with different disease risk and traits. And so we asked first that coding variant signal, do we see any changes in insulin content or insulin secretion? And what we found was that the risk allele increased insulin secretion. Then in our second regulatory signal, we found the opposite, that risk allele is actually, actually reducing secretion. And in our third signal, which we now think is likely being driven through fat or a non-beta cell cell type, we saw no effect. So this might seem a bit contradictory. Why does the risk allele increase secretion for one signal, but reduce secretion for the other signal. But remember, we're looking at coding versus regulatory sequences. So the coding is going to affect all cell types with that sub where that protein is expressed, whereas the regulatory signal might be having a very cell type or temporal specific effect. We also looked in the adipose tissue because remember our mice had reduced adipocyte size, and I was able to show in culture that this seems to be due to a defect in development. And so this was done in collaboration with Melina Klausnitzer, Hans Hauner, and Julius Honecker, where they have a biobank and they're able to look at uh, the particular size of different adipose tissue banks in carriers of the different risk alleles. And for that signal too, we did find a significant association where uh, the A allele saw an increase in waist hip ratio a decrease in type 2 diabetes, and this was associated with reduced adipocyte size. So again, fitting with that smaller adipocytes, more insulin sensitivity, and that is why you have a protective effect of diabetes. So overall, we think that loss of REB1 is metabolically effect, uh, protective, and we have shown this through various genetic model organisms, cellular phenotyping, and also shown in human primary tissue. So what is our outstanding questions that we're working on resolving? So we know that uh, we don't know the causal variants of those two non-coding signals. We don't know the regulatory elements that are at play in those two signals. We also have some evidence that there might be a role in the early progenitor cells, but we really haven't teased out the, pre the precise tissues that are involved. How does that coding allele lead to loss of function? What genes does REB1 regulate during fat and bone development? And how does REB1 loss alter cell fate? And importantly, as we look uh, to translate this potentially to the clinic, what does how does reduced insulin content matter long-term? And we've shown from the genetics that REB1 loss is desirable and protective, um, but how would that work on a whole body physiology? 
So finally, I just want to thank all the members of the Translational Genomics of Diabetes Lab, as well as Team Reb1, that includes Grace Yu and Katia Mattis, and all of our collaborators that I've hopefully, hopefully tried to uh, call out throughout the presentation. And I'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you so much, Anna and Nicole. That was phenomenal. I really, really enjoyed it. So, um, so fascinating. Great, great work. And I, I love the um, the mechanism uh, in 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 the multi uh, model approach that you have. Some um, so people who are in the audience, please feel free to type your questions in the chat and and. Um, uh, myself, uh, Liz Bergner, and Grant will will do our best to uh, post the questions. Um, in the meantime, I I have a question for you, Nicole. So so when you um, see sort of like a reduction in rap one transcript, and and doesn't that doesn't correlate completely with a reduction in insulin uh, secretion only when you induce with foscolin that you you see a defect in insulin secretion. So I'm wondering whether or not like in other settings such as like in neonate or in young children or in people with insulin resistant, would that correlation between the transcript level and insulin secretion play out uh, a bit more? Um, that's a great question. Um, I think it's with our current models, a bit difficult to answer, mm -hmm. but what would be really interesting, and I think this is something that Grace might be following up in an, her independent position, is what happens in the mouse if we knock out uh, Reb1 only in the beta cell? Yeah. And then what happens if we challenge those mice in a more type two diabetes setting? So what happens if we right. put them on high fat diet? Right, right, Are right. they then not able to compensate for that reduction in insulin content? Because right. the beta cells are quite robust, right? There's a lot of insulin there and it causes a, it, in order for diabetes to progress, there needs to be a huge loss in beta cell mass and yeah. insulin content. Okay. Um, so we're not really able to address that question with our current models, um, but it is something that's very interesting and we would have the tools to follow up on in the future. For sure. just said, and I think another opportunity could arise. Um, Nicole mentioned uh, near the start of her slides about uh, the fact that a few years ago now, mapping of a shared deletion in a rhizopathy showed that REB1 is part of the minimal region that is commonly deleted across these patients. Now, looking very carefully at the available clinical information that's been released on those patients, they have there's no metabolic phenotype uh, reported. Mm -hmm. And Nicole, Jenic Clay and our group and myself have tried to work with our colleagues here at Stanford to find out whether or not anybody seeing a patient with Why? one of these chromosome six deletions um, and the rasopathy, because we uh, have a tradition in our lab of favoring studying human models. Mm -hmm. And obviously, if we could metabolically characterize uh, those patients, it would be uh, scientifically incredibly rewarding to understand the impact of Reb1 Reb loss on their metabolic phenotype. Yeah, yeah, I agree. May I ask another question? <laughs> um, so the the rep one deficient animals are smaller. So do you think that um, overall that's mainly driven by a um, in fact in in uh, adipocytes as well as um, insulin uh, glucose regulation or is there potential effect on muscle cells on so? Have you looked at that specifically? So, so short answer is we don't know. Um, it is a bit complicated because we do show an effect on insulin content and insulin is also a growth factor. For, so yeah. there's that kind of <laughs> confounding effect. Mm -hmm. um, but based on what we know about REB1, I, I wouldn't be surprised if there's a role of REB in other tissues. Mm. Um, I think there's a lot of interesting stuff happening at this locus and mm. there have been some studies on it, but really uh, what REB1 is doing across different cell types and in metabolism is really understudied and not known at this point. Mm. 
I think as well, and um, to add to Nicole's comments there, we, we definitely see from the human genetic data this association with height. Um, mm -hmm. There isn't an association, interestingly, that I'm aware of with birth weight, um, but there is with height. And then in the mouse, when we measured the length of the mouse, there was a, a length phenotype. And also Marcel uh, Dern Hood in his zebrafish model zebrafish. has exactly. an effect on the length yeah. of the fish. So um, it, it looks as if it's length rather, not just weight. Well, so to I, pick I, up again I, on what Nicole's mm -hmm. saying, perhaps an effect there on bone growth, um, yeah. as well as an effect on uh, fat mass and fat depot size. Yeah. All right, so we uh, thank you so, so much again for that very illuminating talk, uh, Nicole and Anna. It's um, uh, after the hour now, so I just want to be mindful of people's time and uh, uh, just want to uh, uh, say thank you again. Thank you for having us. Thank you, everyone. Bye.